Hello, it's James from xrobots.co.uk. I've got here my old alien project, which I basically documented on my website. I didn't make many YouTube videos about it at the time, but if you look back through some of my vlogs, you can see me talking about um, the way I made it and what I wanted to do in the future. Um, ultimately, this is a rigid cast, which I sculpted in clay and moulded, and then cast in fibreglass. It weighs about four kilograms, so it's fairly weighty. I also made part of a bodysuit which was made out of rubber by again sculpting, making plaster moulds and running liquid latex in them. In a previous video I commented that that process was quite messy and time consuming and if I did another alien suit I'd like to basically make parts which are rigid that fit all over you, perhaps held together with bungee cord um, so they basically stick all over you like a mesh, a bit like one of those scrap metal sculptures you see of Alien and Predator but with all the parts custom made. So I've been thinking about this for quite some time and obviously at that point I didn't have a 3D printer and now I have. So it struck me it would be quite good to do an entirely 3D printed alien suit. Basically built around a mesh, um, as I say some parts like a scrap metal sculpture, so instead of having a solid head you could have lots of small parts all custom 3D printed and stuck together. So I've been thinking about that for a while. Um, and in the meantime, someone's gone and invented a rubber 3D printer filament called NinjaFlex, which is um, very rubbery and you can print with most extruders, but not all of them. Um, some companies, including Lulzbot, who make 3D printers, and who in fact sold me this filament, have in in invented a thing called a Flexi-Struder, which is especially for extruding this filament. So some of the parts of Alien, like the head, let's have a look at the little Alien, obviously are no good being totally rubber. In the original movie, these were rubber with a fibreglass support inside, um, and I believe that was probably the case for some of the other pieces that stuck out that had to have rigid aspects to them. So if I'm gonna 3D print it, what do we do? Do we make the pieces sort of rigid, and then how do we make joints? We could print them entirely rubber, but then rubber suits tend to kind of wrinkle up at the joints, and obviously that's no good for the head, even though we want the same finish. But what if I could print a hybrid part that's rubber bonded onto a rigid former. So what I've got on my bench now is in fact two 3D printers. The one on the right here is my original Lulzbot AO101 that I've had for I think roughly a year now. It's still going strong, it's been incredibly reliable. Um, basically I can't speak highly enough of it. Um, since then Lulzbot have moved on and they've made um, a new range of printers called the Taz. Um, now I've seen one of these down at my local makerspace, which is So Make It in Southampton in the UK. So Make It were luckily enough, lucky enough to win a 3D printer from Lulzbot. There was a competition where Lulzbot gave away 12 printers globally, and So Make It was one of the winners. So I've had a, a look at the one down at So Make It, and I must say I'm incredibly impressed with it. In fact, I fell in love with it, and effectively what's happened is I've gone and upgraded. So. Even though Lulzbot are a US company, they actually do ship out worldwide through various local depots. So they ship out of London in the UK, um, and that serves Europe as well, I believe. So this one basically arrived the next day. So I didn't have to wait for any international shipping. I didn't have to really worry about it getting broken in transit, about paying duty and all of those sorts of things. So um, that's one of the reasons I bought a Lulzbot printer in the first place, because um, Basically, it was very easy to buy one in the UK and it comes pre-assembled with a warranty and works straight out of the box. So basically, I had more interest in using the 3D printer than I did on building one. And obviously, building them is um, an option. In fact, Lulzbot printers are open source, so you can go and download all the parts, um, all of the CAD drawings for every piece, and you can put one together. So let's have a closer look at the Taz. So by default, the Taz comes with one extruder, which is this one here. It's a modified Greg's Wade extruder. Um, and that's for extruding rigid material like ABS or PLA or nylon or some of the other materials. Um, it's got a traditional hot end. This is a buddish nozzle, which is, I believe, Lulzbot's own design. Um, Heatsink for the cold end. And it's got the idler there that grips the filaments. And, um, you know, a typical stepper motor and a gear arrangement. What I've actually got fitted to this Taz is an optional extra. So dual extruders are an option. They don't exist yet as a product, although they are in development and due for release imminently. Um, in fact, as I said, everything is open source. So if you'd like dual extruders, you can go to devel.lulzbot.com slash Taz and you can go and print your own 
dual extruder. Um, I mentioned the flexi extruder previously in this video, and in fact that's what we've got fitted on this printer. So as well as dual extruders, I have this very green extruder, which is specifically for flexible filaments. So I've got Ninja Flex in there, and then we've got another extruder around the back, the standard Greg's Wade extruder, and that's got ABS in it. So if we look down here, we can see that we've got two hot ends, and these are mounted on one big plate, and there's an adjuster at the front there, which basically winds up so you can level the two. So if you have a look at the development site on lulzbot.com at the moment, uh, this, this arrangement of having one flexible extruder and one standard extruder on this mounting um, basically is currently called a dual extruder with flexi, but I believe it's going to be sold as a product and it's going to be called a flexi dually, so look out for that. Um, there's a big advantage in having them next to each other like this, which is that you don't lose any build volume. So if I slide the carriage forward here, we can see that the extruder that's now at the front still reaches the back of the bed. And if we push the bed all the way back, the extruder at the back reaches the front of the bed. So um, that basically means that we don't lose this much build volume. If we put the extruders side by side, then we would lose the build volume. So um, we've got two extruders, so we can print in two materials, as you might have gathered. So basically what it means is that we can print hybrid parts, which are um, made in one print and fused together with heat. So we can actually build an ABS and NinjaFlex part, which are effectively welded together and made in one piece. So I've got a NinjaFlex part that we've printed here, which is just a uh, very flexible band. Um, that thing is incredibly strong. Um, Lulzbot have a video in their channel of someone hanging on a piece of NinjaFlex and it doesn't break under the weight of a person. So basically all the blue pieces on here are optional, including the extra cabling that goes all the way back down and into the electronics box and then we've also got an optional blue stick there and we've got the dual filament spools. So here's a pretty typical example of something that would have a rigid and rubber component to it. Obviously this is a wheel where the white part would be printed in ABS and the red part would be printed in NinjaFlex. And we can print this in one part so the two are bonded together and made in one print. Um, it's fairly easy to do this so some pieces of software have the option to export a multi-material object. I'm using Autodesk 123D Design, which um, doesn't in fact, it'll only export STLs. But all we need to do is basically export two STLs and then we can use Slicer to prepare the print for us. So all we need to do is delete one piece, say the tyre, and then go to Export STL and save that as an STL. Um, and then go back and delete the other piece and again save the STL um, and once we've got both the STLs we can go over to Slicer and we can get those parts in and Slicer will take care of the multi-materials for us. So here's another piece I had an idea for hybrid prints. This is going to be again where the white is is going to be rigid and the red is flexible so what we've got there is um, a kind of joint so we've got a bendy piece of plastic but the whole thing is encapsulated in rubber so the bottom is completely covered in rubber. I've left the white ABS there so you can see it, but of course that it's all made in one print, so we don't have to be able to see the top surface. We could have the whole thing with the plastic inside the rubber, so the, the outside appearance would be rubber, um, but it would have a rigid thing here. So you could use this for a robotic joint, some kind of shock absorber, or a toy joint for perhaps um, a G.I. Joe or Action Man style toy probably make this joint a bit smaller in that case uh, but the principle is two rigid pieces with a flexible joint in the middle. The second piece is a tank track or a conveyor belt again the, the red is rigible, rig the red is flexible so it will go around um, rollers and so on and the white pieces are rigid which will stop it bending in the op opposite direction. Again the ABS rigid pieces could be encapsulated you don't have to have the ends showing I've just done that so we can see them. 
So this is Slicer. I did a 20 minute video about 3D printing, the general overview of how to use all of the pieces of software from making the CAD file to the finished print. So some more details on Slicer there. The manual is also very good as well. Um, and that's Slicer spelt with a 3 instead of an E. And this is a piece of software that processes a 3D model and actually generates a G code that drives the printer. So um, in, normally we just drag our model onto the bed here. Um, to do a multi-material print, we use this menu option, Combine Multi-Material STL Files. First of all, so I've got my two STL files. I've exported one as the centre of the wheel, as ABS, and the other one as NinjaFlex. So we pick the first one, prompts us again, pick the second one, hit Cancel, and it then says, what do you want to save it as? And it makes an AMF file, which is a multi-material file. So we can save that. Um, now we've got that there, and then we can drag that AMF file onto the slicer bed as if we're a normal 3D model. And if we look at slicer's view, we can see we've got um, the two parts, and you'll notice I, that it cunningly uses the same colours that I've used and the same colour of ABS and NinjaFlex I have, which is why I've selected uh, white and red. White and red is slicer's default, in fact, for multi-materials. I haven't tried doing three, so I don't know what colour comes after. Um, so I've got several uh, slicer profiles set up here. On the right hand side you can see I've got um, one for ABS and one for NinjaFlex. And I've got in my filament settings, I've got two different sets of settings for each type of filament. Um, and in my printer settings I've got two extruders defined. And there are different settings for each so we've got a, more of a retraction on NinjaFlex which is in order to stop ooze coming from that extruder when it's not in use. There's one very important setting for this as well, which is under skirt and brim, which is to put um, a skirt height of 999 layers, which means it will carry on until it gets as high as the print itself. And that basically builds a wall around the print so that it will wipe any excess material from the extruder that's not in use at the time. Um, and that reduces wiping it onto the print. So if you're printing in one colour, you probably wouldn't notice so much. If you were printing in black ABS and black NinjaFlex, I'm using white and red. Um, so it will become evident why we've done that as we do some prints. Um, and from there we can just export our G-code as normal, which I've already done in fact, and then we can shove that into the printer. So we can see the red NinjaFlex being built up there, and we can also see the white ABS skirt, so we haven't got the ABS um, rigid parts on this yet because it hasn't got high enough up. But we can see a bit of red being wiped off on the skirt, so that is basically removing the excess Ninja Flex from the nozzle when it prints with the other nozzle and right at the back here you can just about see some of the ABS getting wiped off on there as well so basically this skirt will get built up to the full height of the print and it helps to clean the nozzles off rather than the excess material getting wiped all over the piece so that's working quite well um, as I mentioned in the slicer settings the filament is set to retract before it switches over so it pulls the filament away from the hot end um, but that has a limited effect because there's always a bit of ooze and there's always a bit of residue stuck on the end. So there it goes with the first uh, middle piece of white ABS which is putting down the rigid pieces and hopefully the springy piece in the middle so there is the end result of the print as we can see um, the uh, skirt has worked quite nicely to wipe the excess filament away from the NinjaFlex nozzle. There's also a little bit of ABS on the back, doesn't tend to ooze so much. But most of that's obviously outside the skirt, which is great because it's not all over the piece. There are a couple of traces on here, uh, which is kind of unavoidable. Perhaps if I'd set the do not cross perimeters setting in slicer, it wouldn't have gone across the white with the red. Um, if you printed the part in one piece, as I say, as I'll do for my alien pieces, probably in black plastic and uh, black ninja flex, then you won't notice that at all. So we'll have to get that off the bed and have a closer look. So all my three test pieces have printed okay. So first of all, let's have a look at this wheel. 
This is the skirt that I printed. Again, it's wiped off lots of the Ninja Flex. A little bit has wiped onto the holes in the middle, um, so I probably need to adjust the retraction settings, but the uh, majority of the plastic is incredibly solid. That's just really on the edge. It hasn't affected the integrity of the plastic part. Um, and obviously what we've got is the rubber tyre bonded on in one go. So that's actually bonded on extremely well. I can't pull that off. Obviously it's welded together with heat as we went. The other thing that I considered was we could print um, a less dense rub around the outside by using a less dense infill. We can do that with a setting in slicer. And then we could make a softer tyre, so that's quite interesting to think about. This one's pretty good, so our sort of caterpillar track idea. Obviously the rubber bends, which is great, but the uh, white plastic bits that go through there in ABS, they bend a bit, but obviously only as much as rigid plastic. So the other thing that we could do with this as well is um, if we had wanted to make a long caterpillar track, we could make this much longer and then we could extend out the rigid plastic so the two hook together. So we could actually make mechanical fastenings on this as well. And we could also have plastic protruding from the inside so that it could grip a sprocket that would drive the whole thing round. So there's lots of possibilities there. Um, that piece has come out incredibly well. It's incredibly tough as well. So lastly, we've got this piece. Uh, which was the flexible joint, which um, the aim was that it would flex this well, uh, this way, which it does quite well in both directions. Um, it also flexes this way quite well. Um, this this five mil of Ninja Flex on the back there, so it's incredibly tough. You can see a little bit of separation where I've bent it around, but if it had the top surface of Ninja Flex on, that would be incredibly strong. Um, and as I mentioned with the tire, if we used um, a lower density infill of rubber or in fact we could print cavities in here, or we could perhaps use a honeycomb infill, and we could make this even softer. So this has got lots of uses for robotics, prosthetics, if you can imagine making compliant joints and actuators, and then just adjusting the infill. So perhaps if it was a piece of prosthetics, you could adjust the density of the rubber depending on the patient, and that could just be you know printed in one piece instead of having to mold and cast it in a different density of rubber um, which would be quite a complicated process to make something with plastic encapsulated in rubber, especially if you had the top surface on, so the whole thing was rubber. Obviously, these pieces are rigid, this piece bends. So, you know, 3D printing's got to be the easiest way to make this and make it adaptable to different situations. So where does that leave us with the Alien project, which I told you about at the beginning? Um, well, basically, next time I'm going to start doing the CAD for uh, various parts of a life-size Alien suit, so... Basically, it's going to involve having pieces more like this one, which are mainly rubber with rigid reinforcement printed inside them. Um, they'll be black, of course, black rubber and black plastic. So we can probably start on the hand or something like that. So it's quite a lot of detail there. The extra long fingers, for instance, can have rigid reinforcement in them. And the detail on the arm, we can do in a variety of ways, um, basically printing out either flat or... Um, ready rounded pieces with the rigid reinforcements inside um, and then as we come on to some of the other sections we're going to need more rigid reinforcement for these pieces to keep them upright um, and we can texture those up obviously we can pretty much print any any shape in plastic or in rubber so the head is going to be quite interesting but I'm probably not going to do that first so subscribe to my channel and check out my Facebook page for future updates